There's some people that's not here. All right, but the frequency of a category is the number of times it occurs in a data set. And a frequency distribution is just simply a chart or a table that gives us a very um, visual image of the frequency of each category. All right. So here's an example of some data. Now, to just look at this data, 50 pieces of data, if we just, in other words, if we just looked at this little square box, not quite a square, this little rectangle box here, you know, uh, we've just got a bunch of, of little uh, pieces of data that say tablet, laptop, desktop, new talk bug, such and such. And there's only uh, four different values. And what it is, it's just that somebody went to a computer retailer and maybe it was the computer retailer themselves. They uh, kept track of the type of computers the last 50 co uh, customers purchased. All right, and so they've written them all down here, and just to have that big block of data, it's not very much use to, um, for anybody to do anything with. So what we can do is order it, and a frequency distribution is one way that we can take qualitative data, and you can also do it with quantitative data to, as well. It's just we have to establish some classes. With qualitative data, the classes are already established for us because they've already bro broken um, it down into four different groups, all right? So all of this data in here is just either desktop, laptop, notebook, or tablet, all right? Now, what they've done, and this is just kind of to tally it. In other words, if you went across left to right on this first row here, and you just put a tally mark at tablet, and then went up to laptop, and then the notebook, and then the desktop, and you meet a tally for each one of those on that row. And then proceeded all the way down to the next 10 rows, you would end up with this little thing here. Now, in reality, with, uh, with uh, statistics, you can usually take and find some kind of a tool like a, a data calculation tool or a spreadsheet to be able to take data like this and count it very easily without having to do this. But this is just trying to show you the process by hand. So, and if anybody is not familiar, but I think most people remember those little tally marks, each one of those that has a line through it represents five. So then for the desktops, we can easily see that there were 11. And then for the laptop, there's 5, 10, 15, 23, and the notebook, there's nine, and then for the tablet, there was seven. Now, we're not going to keep those tallies. What we're going to do is just use the numbers because that's the most important thing is to be able to look at a glance and see that there were 11 desktops purchased, 23 laptops, nine notebooks, and seven tablets. All right, so that is what we call a frequency distribution for something that's nominal because the, the classes are kind of established for you. They're going to fall in one of those four categories, and then that's the number. And all those frequencies should add up to the total number of pieces of data you got, which was 50. Because you take the first two, and let's see, that's 34. And then uh, yeah, the nine is be 43, and then seven makes 50. So the, the frequency should add up to the total number of pieces that you got. Now, um, there's also something called relative frequency.
So uh, when you see these that, uh, this is what I just want to fill in. A relative frequency distribution is a table that just represents the relative frequency rather than the uh, count. What we're going to do is, is just express it. You may have to uh, like refresh because, um, like I said, one of the reasons why I do this on two computers is I can see what I'm getting. So if unless everybody's, uh, you know, I don't, I haven't heard anybody else say anything about that. So probably you just need to refresh your screen, like do um, hit the little um, if you're using Chrome. And I think all the other browsers have that, you know, you just hit that little uh, circle thing with the arrow. And then you should be able to get fresh. You may have to go back through the tests that you went through for the mic and uh, the um, camera. But to see, like I said, is because I'm, I'm getting it because like I said, I can see it on my screen. Like I said, I'm logged in as the user as well as a as the moderator. All right, um, so a relative frequency to, uh, distribution is a table that represents the relative frequency of each category. Now, what is relative frequency? Well, rather than just have the numbers, we simply create a proportion, that's what this is called, and we'll also find out that this is also called probability, and those things are really synonymous. In other words, to find, and this is what you're gonna do with your M&Ms, you're gonna find out what the total is, and that's going to be your denominator. And then you can find the relative frequency for each one of the colors by dividing into the number in the numerator by the larger number. And that gives us what we call relative frequency. So let's add another column. And then we can see, well, the total was 50. So if we take the 11 and divide it by 50, we get 0.22. So in other words, that's the decimal value, and that's essentially like 22%. The 23 divided by 50, 0.46, which is almost half, 46%. The 9 divided by 50 is 0.18, or 18%. And then the 7 divided by 50 is 0.14, or 14%. So that's what we call relative frequency. And so you may see them with one or the other or both, but both of them are important. And on the left is the actual frequency distribution where the, the vertical bar, the uh, Y axis, for each one of the four types of computers, we see the actual numbers, the 11, the 23, the 9, and the seven, and you can see that on the scale of frequency. Now on the right, the bars are exactly the same size, which is what they should be. But instead of just at reg regular frequency counts, we have the relative frequency is on the label. In other words, we just need to make it large enough so that the 0.46 will um, fit, so it goes up to 0.5 just like for the regular frequency, we went up to 25 just to make sure we had enough to go to the 23, and then it's all nice and ordered with my fives. Over here on the relative frequency side, it's done by tenths. Both of them have five tick marks for the main increments. And then the bar just represents whatever that frequency is or that relative frequency. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the bar charts a little bit later. This is just a simple bar chart. But frequency um, distributions and something called histograms, it's a special kind of bar chart, kind of go hand in hand. The bar chart here is, a, is a, just a visual representation of that frequency distribution. You also got something that's called a Pareto chart using that same data. You can just take them, you order them larger to small, call Pareto chart, it's got its own fancy name. 
And two, if you have any technical issues like uh, Kyoko was talking about or blank screen, and sometimes, I mean, there's just things that you can't control if your internet is slow or something like that. That's the only reason why I could think that would happen. Or if you got a lot of stuff running on your computer, it could be several different issues. I mean, I'm recording these, so you can watch them. You just go back into there where it, um, um, where, it, and where the conference is at, where you join, and it'll be in there. I think it stays in there for two weeks. I've been thinking about trying to download them and maybe put them on YouTube or something, but I haven't thought that too far ahead yet. I'm not sure what kind of form they're in. Uh, these are vertical bars, of course. You can also have, um, if you got, like, like I said, long names, uh, a vertical um, chart is not necessarily the best thing because you only got so much room going along that x-axis. But this one is a, a relative frequency distribution. And um, it's got some 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 um, labels that are kind of long, so they make it like this. But now the relative frequency is along the x-axis. Uh, also, um, pie charts are one of those things that for, you know, when you see magazine articles and um, online uh, sites, they're trying to convince you about something and they give you like um, information related to data, a pie chart is a really, really nice way, especially for people that maybe you're not that statistically savvy, uh, they kind of understand a pie chart a lot better. Because a pie chart just represents one whole pie. You got the whole pie chart, you got a whole one pie. And then you can break it into sectors and take out your share of the pie and it'll be a certain size and you could actually, um, well, just for example, down here, it says if a category has a relative frequency of 0.25, that would be 25%. So if you had four sectors in that pie, then that would be four slices of the pie. They would all be even at 25% of the pie. So here's an example of one. Usually in real life, they're not going to be. I mean, if it was a pie, you could do that, and you like to have your pieces of pie all the same size. But if you do on a pie chart, you're trying to make it conform to data. So if we were to take that computer data that we had, then um, this is what we could do with it. We had the desktop, the 22%, the laptop, the 46, the notebook, the 18, and the tablet, 14%. And so we could put it in a nice pie chart as such. All right. See that laptop, the green section is just a little bit shy of 50% because it was 46. The notebook 18, the tablet 14, and the desktop 22. So that represents visually that um, frequency distribution. Or yeah, that frequency distribution. All right, so. Uh, so now let's talk about quantitative data. When you got quantitative data, um, if you got discrete data, sometimes the classes can be decided for you, sort of like we did with the qualitative. But um, what often ends up happening is you got to establish classes because um, oftentimes there's going to be a lot more values. And so you can't just like for example, with the computers, it was four different categories. That's nice and nice and neat. But um, here's an example of a frequency distribution for quantitative data. So um, these things on that left-hand side are called classes. Now, what's important about this is that each one of these class is actually the same size. It has a class width of what we call five, all right? Each one of them are the same size. Now, they don't tell us what this represents. And unlike the qualitative data, and uh, is 
we don't know exactly what the values are in this case because what they've done when they've established this class is any value but that's that uh, that's that's zero to four. We don't know what they are, but we know that there's two of them in there. We could have a zero, we could have a one, we could have a two, a three, or four. We don't know exactly what they are, unlike, but we just know that they fall in that range. Same thing, five to nine. Again, five values in there, and there's four of them in that little cubby hole. The next one has got five also and nine. Five here, there's three. So if we don't have natural categories like we did for that, those computers or, um, I can't remember what the other one we looked at, but there's no natural classes. We kind of got to divide it for them for us. And that's usually what happens with numeric data. And classes are just intervals of equal width that cover all values that are observed in the data set. We'll look at a better example now. This is just uh, to show you the terms. So all the values on the left going down vertically are the lower class limits. So zero is the lower class limit for the first class, five is the lower class limit for the second one, 10 for the third and 15 for the fourth. And then the upper class limits is the outer barrier on that side, 4, 9, 14, and 15. And as I said, these classes width are 5. Now, the reason why this could be a little bit confusing is when you start with 5, people don't usually count when they're counting. They don't count the 5. They'll count 6, 7, 8, and 9, and that seems like it's 4. But you got to remember, 5 is also one of the values in that class. But an easier way to see it is if you take any two that are right next to each other, like the last two, the one that's 10 to 14 and 15 to 19, you can take the 10 and subtract the 15, and that gives you 5. You can subtract 5 from 10, that gives you 5. 0 from 5 gives you 5. Also on the other side, 4 from 9 is 5. 9 from 14 is 5. 14 from 19 is 5. So that's what we call the class width. It's the number of values in any particular class because they really should all be the same size. And there's a reason for this because when we're talking about a frequency distribution, especially for numeric data, it uh, give, we're going to have a special um, chart to represent that. And it's important for all of those classes to be the same size same width. And this is just basically the rules. Every observation, in other words, when you take a piece of data, it's got to go into one of those cubby holes so it can be counted. So the classes can't uh, overlap and they got to be of equal width and that's going to be important later on. And there's no gaps because if there's gaps and you got a piece of data that falls in between the cracks, then, you know, that's not good. It's got to go Every piece of data has got to go into only one class, and it has to go into a class. It can't go in between. And uh, generally speaking, if you have in between classes, some of those may not have any values, but you still have to have them there. And we'll see later what the um, what the visual looks like for it when you do them. Now, uh, for the most part, you don't have to worry so much about um, choosing a class width. This just tells us how do you do it. Because the class width, class width is really arbitrary. And usually what's going to happen with these homework problems is they will tell you, create a frequency distribution with your first class as such, and then that establishes that class width for you. You got to have a, the lower class limit has to be um, small enough to take on your smallest piece of data. In other words, it's got to have a home, the smallest piece of data. 
Oftentimes you might just go a little bit less than that, or you might even use the lowest piece of data as your lower class limit. And then once you've got a class limit, this is all just falls uh, in, in place now. You just keep adding whatever the class limit is, say in the case of five, all the way down on the left. Then you can go over to the other side, take the number that's right next to it for your uh, upper class limit, and then just add your class limit all the way down. And you got to go high enough to get your largest piece of data. And then you count, count the observations and you put it um, in the right spot and then you put the number. So here's one, this is actually some real data. Now, this is 65 vehicles and this is the um, emissions in units of grams of particles per gallon of fuel. All right. Uh, you'll notice that all the values are between, they start either with um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I think it goes up to 6. So they tell us to uh, construct a frequency distribution using a class width of 0. I'm sorry, of 1. So the lower class limit, so the lower the lowest piece of data is zero point. I mean you don't have anything that's zero point zero. So we're going to go out to the degree of accuracy of the data, which is two decimal places. So zero point zero would be the first one. And then they're just going to go all the way down and keep adding one on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side for the first class, they go out to 0.99. Now, believe it or not, that's a one there. <laughs> like I said, because most people don't count the zero. And then they keep, they add one, and that gives you all the rest of them. Now, you could have easily started at 0 0.01 and went out to 1.0. But some, like I said, is choosing the classes is kind of an art. And really, this is the best way to do this because that means when you go back and you take your pieces of data, anything that begins with a zero is going to go in this one. And they're telling us that there are nine pieces of data that start with a zero. You can kind of go in here and see. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, Six. I don't know. I missed six, seven, eight. Somewhere I missed. Oh, there was nine right there. So that's where they come from. That's just did the first one for you. So there's nine that fall into that range. Twenty-six in the ones that start with a one. Eleven that begin with two. Thirteen to begin with three. Uh, three that begin with four, one begins with five, and uh, two that begin with six. And you remember the relative frequency is just simply taking each one of the frequencies and dividing by the total, which in this case was 65. So nine divided by 65 gives us the 0.138. All right, and then if you just go down the way and divide each one of those numbers by the 65, that gives you the rule of frequency. So we got a frequency distri um, distribution for quantitative data. Now, histograms are a very important type of bar chart, and they got a couple of rules to them. And really what it is, it's, it's, it's just a visual representation or a graphical representation of the frequency distribution. All right. So it looks like this. And there's no gaps in it. And that's going to be for a reason. Because these are butt up against one another because there's nothing in between, remember. The classes have been chosen. So there's nothing in between. So.
as you go across you this is what, this is probably one for that one that we saw back over here so that's what that's for it's for that one so let's say we want to construct a frequency distrib i mean a histogram for this frequency distribution we just did well for the, the zeros, there's nine. For the ones, there's going to be 26. So let's look. So zero to one, almost uh, to one is, uh, or zero to 0.99. There's your nine right there. There's your 26. There's your, what was it, 11? And then this one, what was it, 12? Oh, it's 13. It's three to four is 13. Three, one, and then there's two. And then this one is the relative frequency, which is just the percent or the decimal equivalent of the percent. Now, uh, this is, uh, this and this are things that come from the book PowerPoints. And if I had a way to, to do this over, I would not use four classes because that's really too few. Probably the minimum you ever want to have is five. And you don't have to worry about making these decisions, but I just wanted to kind of show you the reasoning behind it because they bring it up over here. So their PowerPoint doesn't match what they're telling you here. But generally, if you've got too few classes, then you can't really see the detail in the way the data is spread out. Likewise, on the other end, if you've got too many classes, like this one over here on the left, then it's very hard to see what you, each of those bars stands for. Now, there's no, you know, cut and dry that we get to say, well, always just have five classes. I would just, uh, you know, say that generally speaking, five is the smallest amount of classes you want to want to have. And then once you start getting in the double digits, you just got to start being careful, you know. I would say once you get out of the teens, it starts getting very hard to have classes that you can accurately see what they represent. So I would just say, if it was me, if it was my world, I would just say, pick always pick an odd number. So you got one in the middle, probably seven to um, 17 classes, something like that. But like I said, it is, each data set is different, and you kind of got to make a judgment based upon that. But you're not really doing these from scratch, so you don't have to worry about that. You can get your uh, the TI-84 Plus to do these. You can put them in an array like this. In other words, you want to put all those values in there, and then you can uh, go through the instructions here, and it'll build one for you if you want. Um, sometimes you can have open-ended classes, but that's a kind of a rare exception here. You can see just kind of the way this works is it's talking about um, the number of deaths in the pneumo of pneumonia from pneumonia. You can see how as you get higher and higher in age that the number of deaths goes up. But sometimes you could use a, uh, an open-ended class at the, at the end or the beginning, but a kind of a rare bird and now if you've got discrete data and especially if you don't have too many values i mean if you've got um discrete data and you've got uh 50 di uh, 10 different outcomes 10 different outcomes like this well this is nine different outcomes because this is the number of children it was they went and uh, surveyed women a thousand women and let's ask how many children they had. So in other words, there are 435 out of the thousand that had zero children, 175 had one. And you can kind of see right here's the uh, two, 22 for two and so forth. And then of course, the more children you uh, get, the fewer pe number of women that bore those children. And so, those classes are kind of naturally decided for you, sort of like the qualitative data was. All right. But sometimes 
um, like I said, is if you've got uh, and children is not a good, good one for the for my example the exception I'm thinking about, but if you've got um, values that are you know 25 different outcomes, you might be better off just putting them into class widths of five, even if it's discrete data. But you know these kind of decisions you don't really have to worry about making in this class. You're just going to be looking at the different types of things. Now. This is why the histogram is one of the most important tools in statistics. And it's because you can, if, because all of these things, they have certain rules to histogram. Remember, all of your data pieces are represented and they got uh, uh, all get put into a nice, one nice cubby hole only. There's no gaps so that nothing falls between. So if you do this and you got certain rules, then you can look at that histogram and tell something about the distribution or shape of the data. See, like on this one right here, this is like a perfect mirror image that as this thing goes up, see it takes two, um, first there's a step of two, another step of two, and then you got one step, one step, one step, and it's not perfectly mirror image, but it's very close. You know, you got one high point in the middle, and then it comes back down at more or less the same rate. Well, that's why histograms are such a powerful tool because they can help us see the shape of the data, which is gonna be something we're gonna uh, need to know starting in chapter three and then in chapter six and throughout because there's something called approximately symmetric data is what this book calls it. And data that's approximately symmetric then we can do something, some special things with it. Now, there's never going to be anything perfect, but, well, you know, it's just a matter of, is it close to being like that? See, this is not perfect, but it's pretty close. This is better than probably what most data in real life would look like. But you can also have data that's skewed to the right. or right skewed, or skewed to the left, or left skewed. And notice that it's not the side that's got the most pieces of data, it's the side of the tail. See, there's a tail there on the right, that means right skewed. On the bottom one, it's left tail, the left tail, so left skewed. That's got a whole different meaning, and when you got left skewed data or left to right skewed data, you know it's it's got different rules you kind of got to go by. So uh, looking at this one again, this one is not a perfect one. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten classes. So these two right here are the middle ones, and and so right in the middle there is more or less a hump and then it starts coming back down. So that's what we call approximately symmetric data, and it's also called unimodal. And we'll find out probably next time what um, mode, when we talk about the term mode, what that means. But that just means that when you're talking about the graph, there's one mode associated with that. Now, this is what they call a bimodal histogram. And you got, uh, basically what it is, you got a hump in there. It looks sort of like a camel. There's camels that have the two humps and you could sit in the middle here. This is what they call a bimodal histogram. And it's not synonymous with the the, the term mode, because like I said, the a calculation of the mode would be the one that's most common, which would be this one. It just simply means it's got two humps. All right. Let me just talk about this one. We're almost finished. All right. Um, sometimes you may have data that's um, uh, there's something called a stem and leaf plot. 
and the stem and leaf plot, the advantages of this is that you get this, you get to retain all your data. If, if you look uh, back over at this one, Uh, remember, uh, uh, see, you've got 69 values that are somewhere between 5 and 40, 13. You don't know what they are. You just know that there's 69 in there somewhere. Same thing with all of the other ones. The second one, you got 178 in there somewhere. You don't know what they are. But with a stem and leaf plot, you get to retain the data, and you can kind of reconstitute it after the fact, and yet you still see the shapes and the patterns of the data. So uh, the stem and leaf depends on the particular data, usually with the ones in the homework. You'll be told what the stem to use for the stem and the leaf. But you simply have the, the stems are going to be what's all the way to the left, and then the leaves are going to be on the right. And you just hook the two up, and I'll show you what we mean. See, this is data. And this works well for the stem and leaf because it's the um, number of uh, 65 and over people in each state and District of Columbia. And these are like, for example, in Alabama, it's 14.1 and 14.3 for Arkansas and so forth. And you'll see there's high and low ones, as you might expect. Florida is real high, and I think that's the highest one, 17.8. And the lowest one is Alaska, 8.1, because, you know, old people don't want to go up there and slip on the ice, you know. They want to be down in sunny Florida where they can play golf and sit out by the pool or something like that. So that's just kind of natural. But notice that they all fall within um, 8.1 and 14%. I'm sorry, 17%. So what they're going to do is they're going to construct a stem and leaf, where the stem is the number on the right side, I'm sorry, the left side of the decimal, and the leaf is going to be what's on the right side, the tenths. So how can we do that? Well, here's our friend Alaska right there, 8.1, 9.0. I can't remember what that is. That might be... Uh, Utah or something. Now, when you start getting more than one, you got 10.7, 10.2, 10.5, 11.5, 11 11.5. 11 then you start getting the bunches of them in the 12, 13, and 14. So you got 12.0, 12.4, 12 12.7, and so forth. So this right here is a stem and leaf that represents that data. Notice that you can see the pattern and shape of the data, that it goes up and it's got a hump in the middle and it comes back down. So you can still see the pattern, but you can also keep your original data, which unlike the histograms with the classes or the frequency distributed the classes, you don't do that. Then you can also order them. Uh, I usually think the ones in the, um, so this would be the first thing you would do in step towards creating this one because then once you got them all then you uh, if you're asked to order them notice that it's the same numbers as these it's just two five and seven instead of seven two and five seven two five was the order in which they appeared in the data but two five seven is with them ordered least the highest so all of them are done like that uh dot plots i don't really know there's a whole lot of use for dot plots but we'll just look at it you can still see the shape but this is the number of children for each of the presidents i can't remember how far how this goes up i know it doesn't go up to with our current president but anyway but it doesn't really matter but what that means is that there were one two three four five six Presidents that had zero children, three that had one, six, seven, eight, nine, ten that had two, six that had three, seven that had four, and so forth. So dot plot is something. It's good to be able to read it, but it's not all that useful, but they're giving it to you. 
it still kind of gives you a visualization of the shape of the data. And lastly, uh, this, um, at least I think this is the last, it's something like a, 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 what we call a time series graph. And it's usually when you're dealing with time, it could be years, um, times of the day. Um, like say, if you were taking temperatures throughout the day on the hour, you could use a time series graph. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So this just takes it from 2000 to 2009. And so they're going to make a dot at the high point, you know, to rep for 2000 to represent the 10,786 and so forth. And you can see, just like you might think with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it jumps around. And then, just like you did back in the old days when you did those connect the dots things, you connect the dot and you can kind of just see what happens over time. You can even do it in the um, the calculator if you want to. And like I said, it is you got that calculator in there. Um, you're not going to have to worry about in this class having the physical calculator if you don't want it. Of course, if you got a Mac, uh, you know you're going to have to look around. I don't know if they have one. Like I said there's a lot of free stuff for Windows and um, even for Chrome, but I know. Mac works a different way. So that's pretty much it. You got any questions, stick around. Otherwise, take off. Um, hopefully, everything will be all right come Monday, and we'll be back here. If um, if we do have to miss Monday because of this storm thing, um, I'll send out an announcement and try to tell you to keep up because we can't take time out you know, we can't take material out of the class, okay? We might have to just skip our experiment with the M&Ms and go over some stuff fast. So if you haven't already, please sign up for that Connect Math because if you leave it to the last, you know, it's, it's going to get tough, believe me. All right? So, all right, it's nice meeting all y'all folks. Hopefully I'll see you all Monday night. Have a good um, little rate. Well, like I said, is you got five days here that you're gonna have that would be very helpful to start on this work. I would try to get through at least chapter one and and part of chapter two. And if you got questions, bring it back or just shoot them to me. You can email them. You can even text. If you t text me questions about material, I'm really not going to be upset about that at all. I'll try to answer as much as I can in a text. Sometimes it's not hard to do, easy to do that, which is why I'd rather you email them. But if you're asking about material, don't feel bad about texting me, okay? I just don't like text where people say, oh, I'm behind. Can you please open up stuff? Because I can't, you know, I've got things opened up as much as I can open, all right? I keep, don't close things on purpose. You know, it's just we got to go at a certain pace to the course. All right. Oh, and I'm going to stop that recording. <laughs>